Excellent. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we are working our way through season two of the future of urban AI. Today is November 8th. And um, pleased to welcome Davide Shaman uh, from Technion. Uh, and I'll introduce him more formally in just a second. Just to remind everybody um, the roadmap for, for our journey, uh, the Future of Urban Tech Horizon Scan, which you can find at futureofurbantech.org. Um, what you're looking at here is just our season two exploration. We've already covered a big part of this, um, this graph of trends of the future that was published by Cornell Tech back in 2021. We have a couple more sessions coming up and we'll, we'll finish that up. Um, today, uh, we're welcoming Davide Schaumann, uh, Director of Intelligent Place Lab at Technion, uh, also Assistant Professor at Technion, uh, formerly, formerly a runway postdoc here at Cornell Tech, a uh, colleague of ours. And uh, we're going to hear about his work um, on reimagining offices uh, with AI and, and simulation. So Davide, I will hand it over to you. And if folks have questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat as we go along uh, or save them and you can come on screen in the second half of the meeting and share those. Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you so much, Anthony and Hubert for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna share my screen and then uh, you let me know if everything looks good. Okay, how does that look? Thumbs up. Wonderful, okay, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, again, thank you so much for the invitation. Today, uh, my presentation will be around uh, 25 to 30 minutes long, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. But again, if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to drop them in the in the chat. And, and Anthony will, will ping me if there is something that uh, uh, should be addressed. Um, so the title of the presentation is uh, Self-Learning Environments from Static Containers to Dynamic Systems. We're gonna touch about the concept of reimagining offices. We're gonna touch about the concept of adaptive buildings and complex facilities like hospitals. And this is a collaborative research. It's very important to say because it's the outcome of uh, several years of research in collaboration with uh, Berkeley, Rutgers, Cornell Tech, Politecnico di Milano and Autodesk. Uh, so right now, a couple a couple of words about my journey. So I'm trained as an architect. Uh, I got my bachelor and master's from the Politecnico di Milano in Italy, uh, and my PhD is from Technion. Uh, then uh, during my postdoc, I spent some time at Rutgers University in computer science. I joined the runway startup postdoc uh, at uh, Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island in New York, where I basically uh, got trained as an entrepreneur to build a, a startup company. I will briefly mention that during the presentation. And now I'm currently an assistant professor at Technion, where I created the Intelligent Place Lab. So let's dive straight into the, the presentation. So uh, we as architects design buildings that aim to uh, meet the needs of the inhabitants. But while on the one hand side, the buildings are static, the needs of the people <clears throat> and their behavior is highly dynamic. So when we design buildings like this one, we may find ourselves the, uh, seeing the building used in this fashion, and this is well before COVID. So this is the result of the over demand for services that cannot be met by the, uh, by the hospital. Uh, this is uh, another example of a mismatch between the design and the, and the use. Um, we see that uh, during COVID or right after COVID, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> So the, um, the trends of work from uh, home uh, was, was very, uh, basically was very dis distributed. So the concept of work from everywhere really affected the way we use office spaces. So as a result, there was a heavy underutilization under of office spaces. So this is an example where the context changes, then the, the design of the buildings or the buildings that we design no longer work optimally. This is other example that we see uh, all the time uh, due to the increased frequency of climate events. This is affecting the operations of built environment, creating heavy disru disruptions, for example, in airports or other transportation facility. So again, the, con the context create major uh, changes in demand uh, for our buildings that no longer can supply and function optimally. So the question that I ask broadly is how can we design and manage environments that meet ever-changing people's needs. 
So in this talk, we're gonna focus on a combined approach between the design of a building, but also the day-to-day -day operations management after the building has been built. So one way to uh, gather knowledge about how to better design buildings is to look at the past or look at the present. For example, you may have heard of post-occupancy evaluation or POE in short, they basically are studies conducted in existing environments where we go there and we interview people, we see how the building is used, and we want to gather knowledge that may be helpful for designing the next buildings or improving the current building. However, it is already too late if you already try to analyze a building because you may not be able to change much. And also, try to gather knowledge from the past and apply it in a different context may be very problematic if the context is different. So what I advocate is from an approach that aims at looking at the past through post-occupancy evaluation, descriptive analytics of prior phenomena related to previous context into looking into the future. Okay. Oh, sorry. So we look into the future through pre-occupancy evaluation. So rather than being after the fact, they are before the fact. So we try to analyze how buildings will be used before we build them also using predictive analytics related to the current context. So how can we optimize a design, but also the operation based on the specific situation at hand, which, may not, which we may not have seen in the past. So how do we look into the future to optimize building design and operations? So here I, I outlined three steps. The first step involves creating a computational model of human behavior in built environments. This means that we basically try to simulate how people use buildings in order to make more informed decisions for designing and operating and managing them. The second step is to apply this model to design new buildings, basically do either a completely new construction or major renovations that involve changes in the design. And the third step is to improve day-to-day -day operations. So after a building is built, how we can basically create some kind of equilibrium between the demand for services and the supply of the resources of the building to make sure the building functions optimally, even though the, there are slight changes in the context. And this, of course, the data coming from operation is fed back into the uh, computational model. So in this presentation, I'll basically dive uh, into these three modules uh, to, to describe uh, some, some um, or how, how they might work. So let's start with the computational model of human behavior. So this is one of my favorite quotes that uh, basically um, led my work through this year, through these years from Herbert Simon. It says, solving a problem simply means representing it as to make the solution transparent. What does it mean? It means that if we cannot represent a problem, we cannot see the solution. So this means that in order to understand space utilization and, and, and human behavior in buildings, we need to represent it and show it somehow so that we can think about it, understand it, analyze it, and improve it. So if we look at the representational methods that architects use and engineers also uh, to design buildings, we see that building information modeling is the, uh, currently one of the most advanced tools. It provides an integrated representation of buildings so that you can basically create a single uh, source of truth model, uh, which is enriched semantically so that you basically design walls, doors, and you have rules on how to compose these elements. And basically it's one single representation to do all kinds of things related to the, to the building. And this type of representation supports analysis of um, all kinds of aspects of building which are physical, okay? So they focus on the physical aspects of buildings, as you see in the top right image. However, the question I ask is, where are the people? How do we know if the buildings uh, that we design supports the need of the people? So I advocate a new type of representation that not only focuses on spaces, which is what architects know how to represent, but also focuses on the people and the activities that people do. Together, this approach creates a representation of events or things that happen in, in a building, which are dependent on the specific space, the specific people and the specific activities. So if you change one of these elements, like the space is different or the persons are different or the activity is different, then the meaning of the event change. So we do want to represent this rather than the simple space. So how do we do it? First, of course, we represent spaces as we know how to do using BIM or other types of advanced modeling, which represent the semantics of the buildings, of the spaces, the equipment inside the building, etc. 
The second element is representing people. Now to represent people, we need to type into other knowledge domains such as social science or psychology. And the technologies to represent people uh, inside built environments come from all kinds of fields, computer science, computer graphics, but also video games. Now in video games, they spent a lot of energy research and, 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 uh, and resources, let's say, to model the behavior of NPC, non-player character, which are basically the enemies uh, inside uh, the games that you may play or in the Sims are actually the characters inside the game. And the goal here is to model realistic behaviors to make the game more engaging for, for people, for the player. And in this case, I type into that type of knowledge to represent autonomous characters or autonomous agents that represent the behavior of real people. So some of the knowledge, again, come from this world. And the third type of knowledge we need to type into is the one of the activities or uh, operations research, which basically uh, investigate how, what, how people do operate in built environments. What do they do? What are their collaborative activities, etc. So here you see in one slide, three worlds, okay? Uh, one is the world of architecture, the world of um, humans, let's say with social science, psychology, et cetera, and the world of operations research, et cetera. So all these need to come together to understand how people use built environments. And this is a representation that emerges from this synthesis. It is an event-based approach in the sense that every single unit that you see is an event uh, composed of people, spaces, and activities. And basically it creates a large multi-agent system. A multi-agent system is a system where agents are computational entities that mimic the behavior of, of people or some aspects of their behavior so that we can analyze how people, how agents interact with each other, interact with the built environments to gather knowledge about how our buildings may perform. So an important aspect of this, of this approach is that we need to represent scenarios of utilization. How do you know what agents should do? So this is very important. We need to gather knowledge through sensors, through interviews, through all kinds of tools to gather knowledge about how people use existing buildings and then model, they call them narratives. So model a narrative of space utilization so that we can understand really how people use built and specific built environments like offices, hospital, airports, et cetera. We do need the domain knowledge encoded in the form of scenarios. So this is um, uh, maybe a little bit of a technical diagram, but, but my PhD was exactly focusing on developing a, a system architecture that would enable the collaboration of agents to reach these kind of complex human behavior scenarios. And this is maybe more for, for the technical uh, part of the audience, but the idea of, of you have probably heard about agent-based simulation. Agent-based simulations are basically simulation where you can encode the simple rules in agents, and then basically by simulating many agents at the same time, complex behavior emerges. One traditional example is the flocking birds. So you encode the rules of a single bird and then the flocking behavior emerges. In this case, it's very hard to simulate hospitals using this logic. So I develop a new logic uh, where basically you put some of this coordination power and planning abilities, not really in the agent, but this in narrative entity, which is a computational kind of puppet master that basically coordinate the agents to perform more complicated behavior and really coordinate their collaboration part. So uh, many narratives are simulated at the same time. So there has to be a narrative manager which prioritizes narrative uh, and performed at the same time. And, and if really you wanna know more, we can chat more later, but, but this is um, basically, this was the scope of my PhD, how to use uh, this multi-agent system to simulate human behavior in buildings. This is one of the outcomes. Um, we simulated human behavior in the um, cardiology unit uh, in the Suraski Medical Center in Tel Aviv. Uh, hopefully you can see my mouse at the bottom right. You can see a uh, doctor and nurses uh, checking patient in a kind of a traditional patient check fashion. So one after the other, but you see visitors here on the, uh, in the room on the left. And when the doctor come in, the, patient, the visitors need to leave. So as you can see, there are a lot of subtleties inside the model. There are a lot of social situation where agents need to respond to. There are planned activities, unplanned activities, decisions that agents make and even randomality on when visitors, let's say, come in to the ward. So all of this can be handled using this uh, multi-agent simulation approach. Um, you may ask, why do we need it? I mean, the, the, one of the biggest benefits is that, as we said before, you can represent something that usually you cannot represent in traditional design approaches. You can visualize the movement path 
of the people. You can analyze environmental parameters, uh, spatial congestion, and where basically the, the clogging happens inside the space, and even social interaction, which may be beneficial for some agents, let's say um, for uh, patients and visitors, social interaction with staff members is great, but at the same time, it may cause distractions uh, from the staff members' point of view. So the simulation may reveal opportunities for this interaction, but then the interpretation of it still is in the hands of the designer who needs to uh, basically um, extrapolate some design, uh, some design, uh, some evaluation, let's say, of the overall design from these analytics. So this is an example of how we can model human behavior. And now I would like to show you an example of how you can use it to make actual design decision. Okay, so uh, in this example, uh, it basically uh, used the human behavior simulation to evaluate two different designs for an ophthalmology clinic, which basically is an eye clinic, an outpatient clinic, where people come in, get their eyes checked and leave. Now, it sounds simple, but actually there may be up to four hours delays in doing this type of processing. So you need to come in, you need to queue at the, at the um, secretary, then you need to wait for the nurse, get your eyes dilated, wait some more, go to the doctor, etc. So it is a kind of a lengthy process. And the, <coughs> sorry, and the designers basically of these two hospitals had two different strategies. On the left hand side, you see the Rambam Healthcare Campus, where basically the waiting area is all focused in one space here, all here. And on the right hand side, in the Mayor Medical Center, the, the waiting area for people is distributed. So in green, you see the doctors. So in one case, there is a separation from the doctor's area with the waiting room. And on the right hand side, there is basically the idea of bringing the patients as close as possible to the doctors so that they can basically are close to their destination uh, for the visit. So simulation in this case helped us understand the implications of these type of architectural decisions. So we collect data about human behavior. We basically uh, could not put sensors uh, for privacy concerns at that specific study. So we use, um, it's called behavior mapping in social science. You go there, you observe, you take notes about the frequency of activities, where activities takes place. And basically we learned um, lots of things about the operations of the facility. And one of the interesting thing we learned is that basically patients tend to wait as close as possible to the uh, doctor's area. Basically it doesn't matter really if the architects design a waiting area, which is far apart from their uh, doctor's room. Uh, people do wanna have control over their environment and they do wanna observe the access to the doctor's area. So these are some of the basically the situations that we also encoded into the simulation. So the simulation is basically uh, consisting of narratives or scenario views. We have planned narratives such as doctor, uh, such as patients coming in and doing all the flow of activities that they should do with some random duration of activities. But also there are unplanned narratives, basically narratives that happen only when some conditions are met. For example, when a nurse and a doctor meet either in a corridor or in a room, then there is a probabilistic uh, factor that they will stop and chat. So these are called unplanned because you cannot schedule them ahead of time. You will basically, they happen only if they meet in the space. So uh, these are the input parameters that we put. Uh, we define the number of patients, the number of doctor, uh, the, the average duration of the activities. And then basically you launch the simulation and you basically see it uh, unfolding. So I'm gonna press play here. You see uh, capsules moving around. Uh, we didn't use very detailed agent models. It was not needed here. I'm gonna walk you through one of them. Basically you see in the yellow are the elevators. People are coming in at random times, they queue at the desk station, uh, then they uh, queue for the nurse, they go to the nurse, then again, wait, and then go to the doctors, et cetera. So we were able to simulate a full day uh, using this approach in both uh, hospitals um, layout. And then the simulation generates quantitative output. For example, what was the uh, walking distances? What was the time it took to uh, treat patients, etc. cetera. But uh, one of the things that is especially interest from a design perspective is basically to see these results on a kind in the form of a kind of a heat map or basically projected on top of the floor plan. And basically the results reveal uh, one thing that, uh, um, that the people in the design process did not really consider is that while they achieved their goal of keeping the doctor's area free from people waiting, uh, because basically they put a door and people could not get in, they created a lot of um, congestion in front of the nurse uh, area. So this is something they did not really consider because nurses were not involved in the design process, uh, which is uh, 
a really bad thing. Uh, and then basically the, we basically the simulation uncovered some of the, uh, let's say, unforeseen consequences of optimizing for one factor, but basically creating a problem on, on another side of the evaluation uh, for another evaluation criteria. While on the right hand side, the basically the congestion is basically distributed across the space, creating problems in front of the doctor's area as they as they basically expected. So the interesting thing here again is that when you design this type of buildings, you don't see all this heat map. You see an empty floor plan. While the simulation can show you some kind of uh, problematic area. And then again, it is in the hands of the designer or the planner or the engineer to understand and to interpret the simulation results. Basically. So um, this was one example on how you can use simulation to uh, design new buildings. And the, um, the, the last, let's say, bulk, which is basically the, most of the work that I will present is in this last section, it basically talks about how you can optimize the operations of buildings. I'm just stopping for a second to see if there are questions. Anthony, I don't know if there are, I see the chat, but I don't know if there are any questions so far. Uh, nothing. Why don't you go ahead and no. finish and then we'll, we'll yeah, bring sounds them good. all at the end because we like to bring people on screen to ask their questions. Oh, sounds, sounds great. So okay. uh, um, um, yeah, Great. go ahead and 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 wrap in, and finish the presentation. So um, the third module talks about how we can use simulation to optimize the operations of built environment. So um, it's interesting how basically I got to this kind of research question. Um, so I was in New York. Uh, I was at the runway program. Uh, I created my company, my startup called Spacemate, and and the goal was really to try to uh, improve the day-to-day -day operations of built environment, like offices. Uh, I was speaking with WeWork and all these new co-working spaces on how you can manage spaces more effectively. And then COVID happened, and 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 this was really only a few months after I started the runway program. So um, my business basically shifted uh, to try to help uh, people reactivate their offices. And if you are an architect or, or if you uh, were engaged in workplace strategy at that time, uh, when we were trying to reactivate offices, you probably have seen all this AutoCAD of the floor plan of a facility with these red and, and green dots. I saw them all the time. Red dot, you cannot sit there. Green dot, you can sit there. And this was kind of a roadmap to reactivate offices. Uh, but this type of understanding does not consider the fact that people move. Right. So again, the buildings are more static, but people move, they go to the kitchen, go to the bathroom, comes out from the elevator. So how do we understand if it's really safe to bring back people um, while analyzing, you know, the human movement or probabilistic movement, right, inside an office space, considering attractor points, schedule for lunch and, and, and bathroom needs, etc. So um, in order to, uh, one of the challenges here was not only to run the simulation, but also to convey the outcomes. Um, again, so far I've been dealing with a simulation in an academic environment where you need to I don't know, write papers, but now you need to convince people like in the real world to make decisions about how it is, if it's safe or not to reactivate spaces. So here the visualization and the interaction part was very important. So this dashboard reveals a strategy for a co-working space in New York on how to reactivate their spaces. So you see their floor plans. It was relatively small space that they wanted to reactivate. And here, what I've done, I computed basically a social distancing index. I basically come out with this metric to understand what are the close counter interaction, the probabilities for this close counter interaction, which could lead to potentially exposure to the, uh, to the, to the virus. So um, on the one hand side, we were thinking about social distance. On the other hand side, we do really want it to improve interactions. So uh, these heat maps basically show the critical area. I'm just going to go back a second here uh, because this analysis shows uh, on the left hand side, how many people are you considering this scenario to bring back? And then you see on the right hand side, the, the, the score or how, how well it scored the scenario in terms of space utilization, social distancing, safety, et cetera. And then you could change scenarios. Basically I'm running towards the end of the video. You change the scenarios. Sometimes you bring back more people and you really want to see how utilization changes and, and the risk for infection also changes. So um, this uh, startup space mate was later merged into a, a startup called Alidate, which now again merged into the startup called uh, Recalibrate. So, uh, the idea is that we, um, uh, the company is running in the in the U.S. and is uh, is very successful because it's helping a lot of people understand you know, how to reactivate space and how much space they need in the post-COVID future. As as uh, you probably know, one of the challenges is that uh, the world of office design moved from a 
traditional, let's say, um, uh, uh, how do you say, when you have numbers, right? You had a factor. If you had this amount of, of, of people in the space, you had that factor of meeting room of four people, meeting room of 20 people. And it was basically kind of a fixed formula, fixed ratio for number of people on how many meeting rooms you, you basically have or desks. But now because of COVID, it all became a probabilistic problem. So what the, the startup does, it basically predicts the probability of a team to show up. And you see here the, 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 the distribution of the probability of each team coming to the office while accounting for their proximity with other teams, right? If my team comes, also that team comes, et cetera. So how do we account for this probability and how do we right size the space? And one of the interesting thing in this kind of graph is that the COVID is very different from a situation where the company shrinks. If the company shrinks, you have less people and that's it. In COVID, you don't have less people. You have the same amount of people and they basically come at a distributed time. But you see the long tail in the end of the probability kind of curve. There may be situation where all the team comes, right? And for example, in call days where you want all the organization to come together. And that creates a lot of problems because you don't have enough space. So some of the strategy that the startup is, is trying to solve is how much dedicated space to give to each team, how much shared space to give across teams, and how much flex you may need to buy on a per need base to basically capture the peaks demand, which the current footprint cannot absorb. And, and you think about it, it's just a trade-off. If you want to absorb this peak all the times, then you may need to have a lot of underutilized space. But if you shrink it too much, you have a lot of peaks to absorb because you don't have enough space. So you really need to try to uh, have a balance as a, a balance of, of a strategy there. Um, the other thing that I basically learned from all this thing is that it's not enough to make a decision only once, right? How do you reactivate this space? You need to make decision continuously on how to every day try to allocate spaces, people and activity in the optimal way. So the transition here is from optimizing not only the building designer strategy, but to optimizing building operations. So the AI very broadly defined here, rather than being embedded into synthetic agents that help designer make smart decision, the AI now shifts into the building. So it becomes part of a building to manage a building in real time. So we transition from smart humans to smart buildings that can basically improve operations on a day-to-day -day basis. So one of the other basically shifts that this concept did is that we basically kind of uh, created a new field. So there is opportunity for a new field, which is called human building interaction. The computer scientists among you or, or interaction designer may be familiar with human computer interaction, a very well established field where people interact with the computer. But here you do no longer interact with the computer, you interact with the building. And the difference is that people are within buildings and they cannot stop the interaction. The interaction is continuous. The buildings, basically the humans shape the buildings, the buildings affect humans. But the buildings also, you see here the cycle, they can sense, reason, act, and learn from the interaction with humans. So all this kind of field is really new. Uh, you, can, uh, you can try to see um, what's happening. It's very, it's very in interesting, basically, all the application of the field. And here, I just wanted to show you one example from my perspective. Basically, this is an example of operations management in a healthcare facility. We start mapping the space, basically, uh, there. Uh, and basically, um, we model it as a graph, so different than before. For when you see a 3D plan of the building, here we, we use uh, mostly a graph representation of the space, and we run simulation of resource allocation. So how can you optimize the allocation of people and spaces and equipment so that you find the optimal combination to satisfy operational need, space utilization need, and even the experience of the people? Uh, so this is a kind of multi-criteria optimization where simulation is trying to find the optimal allocation. But if you're familiar with resource allocation problems, they're very, very hard because the search space is very large and, 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 and it's very hard basically to find this kind of optimal situation, especially if you have a multi-criteria optimization problem, et cetera. And, and also different from other fields like construction where you have some dependencies between activities. You know that if you wanna pour the concrete, you need to have the concrete and then you can start to build chains of activity sequences. 
here, all these activities may be independent. You may treat that patient, you may treat that patient at the same time, but the interactions come from these shared resources. You have limited space, limited people, and, and, and limited basic equipment. So this is a very complicated optimization problem. And you see here that the goal here is to try to make sequence of decision. It's a sequential decision-making problem where you try to allocate resources one time, you may identify a conflict in the future, then you may try to solve the conflict, which creates other conflicts and other conflicts that so basically it branches out. And the goal really is try to understand what is the optimal um, solution to identify the, 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 the optimal route. And for each of these solutions explored by the system, we evaluate it over time in terms of three factors. First, as uh, operational efficiency. Second, space utilization. We wanna make sure that we really use the resources that we have in terms of space. And third, people experience. So we really try to type into the three big domains of architecture, again, social science and psychology and, and operation research. So of course, this mock-up example is not the real search problem. The search is on the right-hand side. There are tens of thousands of, of potential scenarios that must be evaluated. So to really tackle this complexity using brute force, of course, is impossible. So we are exploring right now reinforcement learning, which is a way to basically simulate uh, this type of interaction in a synthetic uh, uh, scenario where you have an agent and an environment. You have an agent that makes an action, for example, oh, try to allocate that resource at that time in that space, something like that. And the environment then receives the action and it gives a reward. Well, yeah, this is a good move or not really good move in the short term, right? And then we can do long chains to see the long reward. But then at every time step, the agent make an action, the environment changes and returns a reward and a new state. And this thing continues to create large trajectories of sequence of decisions, which are explored to identify optimal, uh, basically policies that are called to allocate resource given a current state of the world. Um, and of course, the outcome is of course, to find an ideal trajectory given a state that maximizes all kinds of the scores that you wanna, uh, that you wanna optimize for. And basically um, we are trying to apply these principles of real-time operations management, not only to hospital, but also to think about the workplace of the future. And we talk about reimagining building offices. So this reimagining the offices also comes through this project, which is a European project that I'm about to start. And it's a very compelling consortium of people um, of 16 partners, industrial and, and universities. And basically the, 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 the project is called Sonata, Situation Aware Orchestration of Adaptive Architecture. The idea is that there are currently in office spaces different adaptive uh, uh, technologies, uh, adjustable lights, uh, electrochromic glasses, acoustic ceiling that can change the orientation, even mobile robot partitions exist to divide the space dynamically. So the question is, how do we orchestrate all this technology to improve people's health? So health is a major concern right now, health of people working from home, working in cafe, working in co-working spaces. So this type of, this project will really tackle the orchestration of different architectural system to improve health in different types of workplaces. And another project that I'm uh, passionate about that I'm working on is to tackle the problem of collaboration uh, for distributed organization where some people may work in a physical space and some people may work remotely. So as architect, we know how to design physical places, but there are also new technologies that enable uh, us to create uh, virtual places, Second Life and Spatial, there are many, there are many technology out there. But if you think about an organization where some people may work in a physical space, sometimes in a virtual space, there is a gap between, between the two worlds that do not actually communicate to create a shared sense of place among people working across uh, these type of uh, realms. So these projects try to uh, merge the domains by saying, what if you could take a physical person and project it into the virtual space to make them accessible through virtual reality? People working remotely can see these people working from the physical space in VR. And at the same time, taking people working remotely and project them onto the physical space and make them uh, interact, let's say, interact with them uh, through augmented reality. So uh, this concept creates this new opportunity to create hybrid places where people are both in the physical world and virtual world at the same time. And you can basically collaborate 
across people across domains. So this is just an example. It's the last projects I'm showing today. So this is a library of the Technion. Uh, here we created a system where we use sensors developed by students, really uh, very uh, cheap and scrappy sensor we built uh, uh, thanks to these uh, students. And basically they collect data about uh, counting people in a space, uh, occupancy sensor if somebody is, for example, sitting at the desk and even presence sensor. To, to count people in larger areas. So we bring this data to the cloud and then we connect it with Unity 3D where we create a kind of a metaverse or a virtual representation of a digital twin, let's say of the physical library, which can be accessed through uh, avatars and agents. And then in the last step of the project, we project this type of uh, virtual entities onto the physical world using augmented reality. And maybe one of the things that I didn't mention before is that this idea was a, basically a response to the old metaverse trend, which says, oh, let's all be in the virtual world as much as possible. And I try to think how we merge the worlds so that uh, we, we're not going to be, you know, tied only to the physical, to the virtual world, which is um, uh, a pity for health and all kinds of um, considerations. So these are the data coming from the sensors uh, here located in the library, the present sensor, uh, the counting sensor at the entrance and the um, uh, area sensor. Uh, these are an image of the sensors installed. Uh, this is a log of the data. They basically count people or sometimes they say just, oh, there's somebody here or no. Uh, so it's a yes or no answer uh, question. Uh, and basically this is the data fed into Unity 3D. You see here in white, the people uh, basically projected from the physical world into the virtual world. This means that at these time steps, there are four people sitting in this uh, time in the physical space, okay? Uh, and then this is a virtual representation of the um, uh, uh, library. So here you can have in white, you see the people sitting in the physical space at that specific time. And in blue, you have agent, synthetic agents going around that could be interacting uh, with you. And in yellow, it's me, right? An avatar uh, working remotely and trying to access a digital twin of the library. And the final step of this pipeline is basically to, uh, for somebody in the physical space to see uh, the avatar moving into the virtual world. And we use the phone just because it was a demonstration. Tomorrow it will be glass. In three days, maybe uh, contact lenses. And in four days, maybe holograms, whatever. The idea here still is that you make visible people working remotely and you suddenly see them and you can potentially interact with them and basically create a shared sense of place where people can, can basically see each other and interact with each other, right? That's just a mock-up prototype that opens up the door actually for potential developments. So um, I would like to wrap up this presentation just to say that um, we saw today an opportunity to create self-learning environment, environment that basically learn from future forward-looking simulations. So they look into the future, they learn optimal policies, they apply them for design and operations, and then they learn from the outcomes. Um, when I talked with, uh, with Anthony, we, we thought about, okay, what are the broad uh, lessons learned, let's say, from this? So it's a little bit more speculative, this part. But where is this all heading? So the first thing is we try to create artificial intelligence systems to inform decision-making, okay? So this idea is that AI is pervasive and it helps us make better decisions. Self-learning is also very important. So we learn not only from past data, but also from simulation about the future so that we can try to find solutions that are tailored to our specific context and not the context of yesterday. The third thing is that we want to have a comprehensive understanding of design and operations together. There is no longer a distinction between, oh, I designed the building and then you use it, good luck, uh, and somebody else coming in, try to operate it, no. The design of the facility should account of how it can be optimized uh, for operations, and this is a single loop. The third, the fourth part is that um, we should have a holistic perspective on the concept of sustainability. So no longer focus on, sorry, not only focus on environmental sustainability, which is a core issue at the moment, but also consider social adaptability and operational adaptability in a kind of a combined manner. What are the limitations? So there are several limitations. Maybe we can chat more in the, during the question and answer, but here I just want to name a few to basically open up the conversation. Lack of transparency and sense of controls. If the AI makes a decision um, uh, uh, with me, okay, uh, how do I know what, uh, if the recommendation is good? So you kind of lose a little bit the sense of control here when you make decision. Challenges for equity and inclusion. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, the data that comes into the model needs to be very well supervised, but also when you think about optimization, it's very critical. For whom do you optimize? Do you optimize for the manager? Do you optimize for the doctor, for the nurses? What if there are nurses with special needs? Do you account them in the model and you give tailor-made recommendations? 
Um, the third problem is more technical. <coughs> Sorry. So how do we scale this? Let's say that we learned something in one hospital. Can we apply to another hospital or no? How do we scale to a larger building rather than a small building? So all this is very challenging, especially with reinforcement learning. Uh, you have many, many challenges of scalability. The last one is complexity of adoption. Let's say that we design an incredible system, but people don't want to use it because they're afraid of, of uh, basically giving away some of the control of the decision. So how we make sure that these tools are adopted. And the last thing is recommendation for the future. So these are four lessons that I'm, I basically uh, learned from all these attempts that I've made and I'm currently making. One is to develop solutions that assist human decision making and not replace it. Now, the European Union is very, uh, and probably also in the US, but in the European Union, when you we rent grants, we really need to explain why this AI does not replace people. It just integrates their decision making. So this is very important. So we want to assist people. Second, human in, the loop, human in the loop approaches should be across the segments of the development and deployment. You want to have a human in the loop when you develop the AI to, to make sure that you really debug it and you make correct assumptions in the model. When you use it, you want to have a human using the system and learning from it and communication. Let's say that the AI made a decision. How you can explain the decision that the AI made uh, to humans. Okay, That's very important. Third, Consider non-rational human behavior. And this is something that I'm, I'm not yet arrived to in my research, but I just can't wait to, to start dealing with it. In my models, people behave in a way rationally. So if you recommend them to do ABC, they will likely do it. But actually, we know that it's not like that. People really act how they want. So uh, accounting for this more unpredictable aspect of human behavior is critical. The final one, it's something I'm, I'm uh, considering in these very days when I'm working on reinforcement learning, is a balance between domain knowledge and domain agnostic solution. And I don't know if you uh, read it, The Bitter Lesson, by Sutton, I highly recommend it. It basically raised the question, says, okay, uh, the computational power of, of AI is scaling up with the Moore's Law, so every year, you know, the, the computational power increases. So right now, we may be stuck with a computational intensive problem, and we try to throw at it domain knowledge to solve, to, to improve the speed of the search right now. But it creates a lot of complexity if you think that tomorrow or next year, the speed of the system will be much faster. So how much domain knowledge should we put? Because in a way, make experts very happy that they use their knowledge and they put it into the system versus domain agnostic, which makes us a little bit more uncomfortable, but may scale very well. So um, I just wanted to thank all the people who contributed here. And there are many more than the one here. These are my lab members. And a special thanks to uh, Professor Yuda Kalai, who uh, was my former PhD advisor and collaborating with me on across uh, several of these researches. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And really look forward to, to your questions. Thank you so much, Davide. Um, I'll just say, like, I think this is the third time I've heard you present some of this work. And every time, you know, I, I capture something new. And what really struck me was, you know, the richness of the um, model of human behavior that's embedded in all of this. And I think it's really important to recognize that, um, you know, these, these are more than NPCs uh, that, you, that you're modeling here. Um, there's a bunch of questions in the chat. I'm going to ask folks to share some more. Um, I think the first was from Francesca Burks, but she has left. Uh, unless you're there, Francesca, speak up. Um, and she's basically asking, um, you know, getting back to this idea of the model of the, the underlying behavior, like whether you're imputing like demographic characteristics on these agents and, and does that translate into changes in how you're modeling like their, their physical movements and their traits? Uh, sorry, Anthony, you break up a little bit. Can you just repeat the, the, the question? So she, she, Francesca asked, do you ascribe demographic characteristics to the agents and update mm -hmm. their movements to correspond to their physical traits? Oh, so I'm yeah, going to guess the... like age might be a big part of that. Yeah, so um, that was part of some of the work I didn't show here, but we uh, at Rutgers, we focused on even the gait movement of the people. Uh, we basically developed a footstep simulator that basically not only, you know, it's not a, an agent moving around, but we represent the steps 
how people turn around with the steps. And then you could embed all kinds of things related to uh, the movement of, you know, how really you move their body, speed, uh, age, and all kinds of things. However, this is a very detailed model of the uh, human body. Uh, which was not really the focus on on, on our simulation. So um, a critical aspect, but that's a great question. And actually it opens up mm. the door for the, the concept of level of abstraction. Level of abstraction is critical here. If you want to put in all the detail that you want, you're simulating reality, which is impossible. So abstraction means removing. So when you model something, you need to think not really what to add, because it's very easy, ideally, to add more, more, more. But how do you remove, 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 so that the overall simulation is realistic in a way? So I think what you mentioned is re very relevant for some context of, um, for example, hospitals, how you move, uh, how you simulate the movement of elderlies, or even people that cannot really hear well. <laughs> Imagine that we call them, they may not respond. So this level of detail, I never uh, got the privilege to, to, uh, to work in with it, but I think it's a great extension to some of the work we're doing. Uh, Nancy Manoj had a question. Nancy, do you want to bring yourself on camera or come off mute and ask your question? Um, hi. Hi, David. It was a really good uh, presentation. Um, as someone who has a background in architecture and now working in urban planning, I think this is a great tool that I think uh, can be translated even into urban planning. Uh, one of the questions that I had when you were showing the office space simulation, um, I saw that when you played it, I don't know if this is just because of the clip that we saw, but all of the agents were moving at the same time into the kitchen, causing that sort of, um, I don't know what, constriction of area in the um, hallway. So are all of these simulations coded for like the worst case scenario in terms of circulation or was that just because of what we saw? Yeah, uh, it's a great question and uh, a great, uh, you really uh, got a um, great catch. So what do you say? So um, that was a new experiment that I've done basically based on a, on, a, on a new patented technology that basically works differently from our simulation. So when you simulate hospitals, you basically uh, uh, have a sequence of operations that you want to do. You press play and you see the operations unfolding. In offices, is a lot made on scheduled. Some scheduled activities, some unscheduled activity, etc. So the technology that I developed when I was doing uh, uh, office simulation is based on a scheduler which basically takes as an input all the requirements of the teams, how many meetings they're supposed to have today, mm. how many uh, unplanned meetings they may have. And then it is a very large optimization problem. And why it's an optimization? Not because you optimize the schedule, but because we want to create a synthetic schedule that matches the demand for the teams. So when I generated all this synthetic schedule, I basically enacted it to show where people are going to likely move at that time step. Some people may move to a meeting, some people may like to the kitchen. So the visual effect is less compelling. It's more coordinated, but behind the scenes, there are much stronger technology that looks at the whole day or where people could be. So it's not really a worst case scenario. It's just that uh, in that simulation run, uh, these amount of people were expected to, to go to the kitchen through a combination of random alley, et cetera. So you saw them all moving at the same time. It's just that it was not really built to show the movement. It was more built to, to create all the scheduling and the expected density. Uh, but yeah, in general, we do not aim for the worst case scenario because then it would be, you know, kind of a way to... Uh, um, well, to buy a say, oh, look at my simulation reveals that it will be a disaster. Well, if you label it as worst case scenario, then show even the best. So usually my simulation uh, aim at representative day-to-day -day scenarios. Uh, and then we, we rarely go on the, you know, uh, extreme, right? Suddenly overflow the people, the, the, the building with people or have nobody there. So we try to strike a balance. But good catch with the, with the visualization. No worries. Thank you. Yes, we, we, we always bring the pros to the audience. Um, Ariel Neumann has a question. I'm going to ask him to come forward. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. It's uh, wonderful to see, to see the work developing. I've seen it um, a few times before, but it's definitely uh, catching up. So, so thank you for that. Um, I have a question with basically two questions with 100 years uh, of a gap between them. Um, I think the first one would be about the, I think, uh, renaissance of agent simulation that we're seeing nowadays. Uh, if, if you've all heard about LLM agents, which are becoming super 
uh, exciting uh, around there. And just on Monday, there was a big announcement by by OpenAI about their agents. And, and I think Ooh. in general, we're seeing more and more sort of return to a technology that people thought uh, might might uh, might died in the 90s, becoming more and more relevant. So I'm, I'm curious uh, first to hear about your um, uh, thoughts about using LLMs to inject some more humanity into your agents beyond their trajectories, demographics, and some other criteria. But can you, you know, start and have a conversation with your agent and start to sort of, um, you know, uh, learn from them their their decisions and, and reactions. That's the first part, and, and and the second part, and I can return to that if if you forget. The second part would be a hundred years before that, when uh, Corbusier in the nineteen twenties. Um, thought about the future building, he was basically presenting the domino, the domino um, um, stacked plates of simple building with a few columns that hold that together with an understanding that if you create that open space, which is completely, uh, uh, you know, free of any constraints, you would have the maximum optimal control in terms of, of replanning it and changing it down the road. So I'm asking, you know, in a meta level of your work, wouldn't that be sort of uh, kind of the optimization, the best optimization would take you eventually to a, an open floor plan, right? Mm. The place where you can always remove and change the, the facility. So these are two different, very different questions, but I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think they're amazing questions. So <clears throat> with the LLM agent, I'm mostly referring to the Stanford paper, uh, the one that was a couple of months ago. Yeah, with the LLM, that's the one I saw and I, I was not aware of the announcement of the open AI, but I'm uh, glad that that happened. So um, I think overall, uh, the, the simulation is tied to a goal, right? What do you want to achieve? So when I read that paper, uh, they basically try to create synthetic societies. So they want to say, mm -hmm. what if you have an agent and these agents can communicate with other agents and you need to organize a party? Let's see how this information unfolds and the spread across the thing and how a party kind of emerges from the interaction with, with people. I think uh, that that could open up the door to simulate new types of interaction in places that I haven't uh, really thought about. So in hospital, I don't think that the overall behavior emerges through <clears throat> LLM interactions. <clears throat> you have a high operational aspect. You need to do some activities, you need to be efficient, you need to use resources efficiently. However, mm -hmm. if we look at other contexts, such as open urban plazas or social interaction in, uh, in uh, museums or social space or something like that, then we could try to learn how specific space configuration may trigger opportunity to interact, but also to talk about the space that the agents see. For example, have you seen that angle of that uh, you know, museum, which is particularly attractive? So I think that, that the, this opens up the door to simulate, yeah, human behavior aspects in other types of contexts I haven't thought, but, uh, but I, and I think it's super, super exciting. Uh, on the thing of the open plan, so, I mean, you know that, that open plan in offices doesn't really work. So you try, at the beginning, everything is closed into rooms and then it says, no, let's, we want everybody to, to see everybody else and talk to each other. But then there is a very big noise uh, and people suffer from lack of control, lack of privacy, uh, noise in open spaces. So then you start to redivide them again. So I, I don't, uh, I'm not a fan of finding one architectural solution that will solve all the problem ever. I think uh, what is important is that together with an architectural design strategies like open plans, which is still very brilliant specific, in specific context, you need to move, uh, you need to um, put a human, human behavior optimization on top of it. So the space adapts together with the people. And then you can mix and match based on uh, people needs. If you think about the activity-based uh, workplace, you may have heard of it. So the idea is that you characterize spaces based on the activity it affords. And then on top of that, you may have a layer of personal preferences. So doing that match is not only a space problem, space design, but also making people aware that that space may be available in 30 minutes, so you may want to go there and look at it. So the way I see it is that the best, even the best architectural design solutions should be coupled with um, a human understanding on how people use it, the preferences of the people uh, and their needs for the activities they do to be able to do perfect matching. Having said that, it was a genius, no, no answer. So, so <laughs> these open plan strategies are still very adopted in, in hospitals to have you no know, interstitial floors and keep the, so all of these are brilliant solution. From my perspective, particularly, I'm trying to really see the balance between the space aspect and the human aspect. 
Excellent. Wonderful. Thanks um, for the question. I think we're yeah, it was a great question. Um, I think we're going to stop there because we're a little bit over and we're approaching the top of the hour. Um, a big thank you to Davide for sharing thank all you. this fascinating thank you. research. Um, thank you for all the questions. I just want to quickly highlight um, the next event uh, will be next Wednesday, November 15th with Solida Guilera. We'll be talking about um, urban AI in Latin America. Um, so more of a practitioner's than a researcher's perspective, which will be an interesting shift for us. One thing to note is because we're going to be holding that event in conjunction with the Urban Tech Summit at Cornell Tech, it will be a little bit later in the day. It will be at 2.15 in New York, uh, 8.15 in Paris, um, and then a little bit earlier on the West Coast where Soledad is. So I uh, hope you all join us. And um, let me see if I can pull this up. Uh, as uh, always, we post these episodes to um, to the YouTube channel. It takes a couple of days to get prepared, but you can also watch all the previous episodes. So uh, once again, thank you, Davide. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. See you. Thank you so much. Next week. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.